Princess Yachts, the UK's leading luxury yacht manufacturer, proud sponsors of Motorsports Formula One coverage. So without further ado, please welcome onto the stage Damon Hill, a patron of Halo, and Karun Chandok, a patron of VDCT. Right, I, I probably undersold you a bit there, didn't I? I didn't mention that you were world champion. <laughs> or, ah. or All indeed, that work. Or, 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 or indeed, was it 1983 when the champion of brands on a Yamaha TZ something? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah I think uh, it was 83. Champion yeah. on two wheels and four, John Surtees, basically. Um, well, it was only the champion of brands. It wasn't the world championship or the Isle of Man TT yeah. or whatever else that yeah, John won. Fair. Because he did have, um, just when well, he was, he was the top of the top of the field, wasn't he? Completely he was. In both, in both categories. And I also yeah. failed to mention that Karun, who um, had a fleeting Grand Prix career with a couple of rubbish teams. Um, the, they were. Uh, they, they, they were. It's, fair, it's not unfair, is it? Um, you became a father relatively recently, and the first thing you did after that was to go off and race a McLaren M1 at Goodwood. Well, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh... But you did win. I did, but it's 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 You're his first. Still it's his, uh, sp- still, please. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> you got, you got, <laughs> thanks, Dad. You got sparkling. Well, 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 no, that's fine. That's also, fine. there's lipstick on that one. Okay, that's mine. On that's, mine. that's yours, is it? Yeah. All right. Well, so we'll, we'll take that. Yeah. We'll start again. Still, I'll start again. Um, still, yeah, yeah, no, it's his it's his first birthday tomorrow, so that's gone pretty quickly. Um, yeah, but racing with McLaren are good. That's pretty special, isn't it? It was. Yeah, it got a little bit awkward when Excellent. one of the marshals came to my wife, and she was I think she was five or six months pregnant at the time. And he, uh, this is the year before, and um, the marshal came to my wife and said, do you know this car's called the Widowmaker? Oh, God. And then <laughs> pro- <laughs> proceed, proceeded to tell her the story of the Bruce, of, obviously Bruce McLaren's accident at, at Goodwood in a can McLaren as I was getting in the car, which, which was not the best idea, but um, still a week. Right, we're here to talk about the 2019 Formula One season. Let's move on to that. Um, the format basically, we'll chat, talk nonsense for 45 minutes or so, and then there'll be an opportunity for you guys to ask sensible questions um, for 15 to 20 minutes after that. Um, did we see peak Lewis Hamilton this year? Can I just ask one question before you get on to that? Did we make a prediction in March as to what would happen? You did. And do you remember what it was? I meant to watch it online. Okay, and we'll forgot. get to that in a minute. Uh, no, there we go. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure you, you all said that Lewis was going to be world champion. No, no prize there, eh? Yeah. yeah. And, and you also predicted that Red Bull and Honda would win races. Oh, yeah, that's good. And, and you said very correctly that Pierre Gasly would be crap against Max Verstappen. Which God, look- we're good. We should yeah, be on TV doing this stuff. It's a little bit harsh. Yeah. It's quite <laughs> harsh, isn't it? I, mean, he was, he was I did good. say he was going to be crap. And he finished yeah. brilliantly. And he was brilliant was at the Toro Rosso. I was, I was par- well, yeah, but that's weird, yeah. isn't it? He, he's supposed to go fast in the fast car, but he goes fast in the slow car. We'll get on to that. Right, okay, um, go on. Are we hijacking your, yeah, your, that, your yeah, plan only slightly, here? Only slightly. Oh, it's a good on. observation, though. It's but, true. Um, yeah, Lewis, I mean, when he first came into Formula One, I mean, when you came into Formula One, you were already turned 30, you'd had... All right. <laughs> <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't my fault. I was trying... <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was an observation, not an insult. The, but the, um, you know, you'd been through an awful lot of hard knocks and real life experience I mean, you lost your dad as a teenager your teammate was killed out of your first f3 season yeah that's true i mean you, yeah. you'd had a lot of you know pretty difficult real life experiences you were a pretty full i know you're older i don't I, my career does not compare in no, any no, way no, to, no, no, to no, lewis no, hamilton's but, I understand. but when he came yeah. in yeah i mean he'd i know he'd had a tough upbringing initially suffered bullying racism yeah, yeah. Uh, his dad had to put up a state agent's board for 10 quid a time whatever to raise money for karting initially yeah but then once he'd been adopted by zip and then Ron yeah. Dennis. He was kind of kept in a little cotton wool box, which gave him relatively little life experience. Yeah. Um, That's so possibly. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, the truth is, we don't, no, how, we much, don't. how much but life experience we it, don't it, know it, what happened. But yeah. the emotional maturity that yeah. somebody like you had coming in at an older age, yeah. he didn't seem to have when he was 22, 23, whereas now, yeah. as, a, a, as the age you were when yeah. you came in, sort of thing, more or less, uh, uh, um, yeah. he, he seems just a complete, a much more complete. I mean, you get the odd hissy fit on the radio, but yeah. they all do that. But no, I think, speaking, I think you're, uh, you, you, you start off by saying, have we seen peak Lewis? I think Lewis almost made it look easy this year, didn't he? I mean, Even though he, he didn't have the best car. He, uh, sometimes it wasn't the best car. Sometimes it, it was out of, out of sorts. Uh, maybe sometimes he dipped, but not, not that often. 
Um, I have to say Valtteri has is, is not been the challenger that Nico was. Nico, uh, by his own admission, became Mr. Nasty, um, you know, to try and get the upper hand on, on Lewis and put a lot more pressure. And Lewis looked a little bit out of sorts at times in, in competition against Nico. I think he, was, he found, his, found his match a little bit occasionally. Attack, you know, within the politics of the team, but maybe. Um, but this year, he's, you know, he's very much together. I think he's all, a lot of the parts have come together to the point where he's able to do it at a, at a stroll. He's organised his life. He's matured. He's got very creative in other aspects of his life, and, and he manages to balance everything else he does with being uh, the leading contender in Formula One. So it's it's. But he's, as you, as you said earlier, he's been doing this a long time. So he's had a long time to sort it all out. But he's still only 34. But I think also the, the whole season is, it, the, the picture is completely skewed, if you, if you ask me. Because if you, if you add up all of the mistakes, and, and there were so many from Ferrari yeah. and Leclerc and Vettel across the year, you know, they should have come to Abu Dhabi with Charles only nine points behind Lewis. Um, admittedly, Mercedes had the better car at 75% of the races. Low drag circuits, Spa, Monza. Um, Singapore was an anomaly. I think um, Mercedes is it's a bit of an Achilles heel, Singapore, in many ways. But there were probably six races in the year where the Ferrari was unquestionably the better car. Uh, Red Bull started off on the back foot. You know, the front wing change hurt them much more than everybody else. It took till Austria when they brought an update where they really joined the party and, and Max duly won. But by then, Mercedes had won the first, you know, seven races or whatever. So I, I think the whole, it's a bit of a shame because the, the championship battle could have, could have and should have been so much tighter and better. But, uh, unfo- you know, once again, Ferrari, you know, the perennial underachievers in many ways, really. Um, just well, maybe they, maybe they do it. overachieved, if you know what I mean. Well, in the Michael years. Well, I think... Oh, that, you mean that, this year? I think this year they kind yeah. of maybe... The, the, the question you have to ask now about Ferrari is like how much of their performance was achieved during the year um, through using way, uh, means that were um, later banned. If you, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I'll let you ask that question. <laughs> But, but yeah. at the end of the day, they this, wanted... is, this is being recorded, by the way. Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so we, we are conscious, that, you know, we, we don't want to get a, a lawsuit from, from, from them. But they, I know, they, I they, know they, who will be talking yeah. to Binotto when we get to Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Binotto will still yeah. be in charge when he gets to Melbourne? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, he's... If he was in charge of a Premier League club, he'd have been gone by now, surely. No, he'd get another, he'll get another year, won't he? You know, they, they seem to get a couple of years at least mm. before they get booted out. Yeah, um, it's, it's a tough environment for Ari. Who'd yeah, want that job? I mean, that, it's, it's, it's going to be the most high-pressure job in the sport, isn't it? You yeah, know, boss of Ferrari. Well, worse than being on the Skypad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you can re-record that bit, <laughs> <laughs> and it's only television. <laughs> Just going back briefly to to Mercedes. Um, well, I mean, at the beginning of the year, Bottas disappeared over the horizon in Australia. We've got a new, improved Valtteri Bottas. Yes. Yeah. And then. I mean, that only, he only appeared a couple of times thereafter. Yeah. It's Russia hard though, isn't it? I mean, he's up against the best driver in his generation. I know, you know, I get Nico, Nico did it and managed to, to sneak ahead of him one year. But in reality, he only won that because Lewis's engine blew in Malaysia. Yeah. You know, he lost 20, 25 plus the seven that Nico gained or whatever, or three that Nico gained that race. So it's not... I think Valtteri... Valtteri had four or five strong weekends where he, he you know, was able to take Lewis on. It's not enough to win a world championship against Lewis. But, you know, it must be so difficult. You, you know, you speak to Johnny about being teammates with Michael and, OK, there were other circumstances there. People like Rubens or Massa, you know, when you're up against the best driver in your generation against in the same team, it's bloody hard, isn't it? And I think Valtteri is an, is an excellent racing driver. But he's not Lewis, and I think that's, that's and He's also the point. probably exactly what Mercedes needs, because he, he'll he plot home second or third all the time. Yeah. I mean, it, it, which, and Plotting no, is a little harsh. Yeah, it is a little harsh. It's a little bit harsh, no, yeah. I can see. But it's, um, <laughs> he, he will, he will, he'll get the thing to the chequered flag yeah. 99 times out of 100. That's what you and want. There's, and, there, and there's no friction between teammates. Yeah, so, but you know, you know, actually, if, I, if I were putting, putting on my Toto Wolf cap, 
Okay, there would have been races where I would have looked at um, Nico's performance and I would look at where Lewis was, was and I would think, blimey, if we didn't have Lewis, we'd be fifth or fourth. Mm. And that's a problem, isn't it, for them? They know that that is the measure of how much more value you get from, from someone like Lewis. And it's worth every quid he gets, I think, for them, you know, because that, that would cost as much of that, not double, if they were to find that performance in, in, the, in, in, in development. Exactly. I mean, the, the great drivers win the races that they shouldn't normally do. You know, Lewis Sochi this year, mm. he pressurised Ferrari into all of those mistakes and the team orders mess and all the rest of it. Mercedes won the fastest car the weekend, and yet he put enough pressure on them that he won it. And... Valtteri was 15 seconds behind, and and that's that's the difference. But um, yeah, I mean he's he, he's got another chance next year, hasn't he? Because Ocon's yeah. gone off to Renault, so they've they've given him Valtteri a, another another opportunity. Um, he's got to try and dig deep over the winter and see if he can come back. I, th- I think each each year Lewis goes away, he gets away from it all, and I think I get the feeling that when he comes back to a start a new season. It's almost like he's kind of half still on holiday. You know, I have seen a lot of the starts of the year. In fact, um, Michael was very similar. He quite often got beaten by his teammate on the first, first um, race. And um, I'm thinking now, actually, I got beaten by Jack Villeneuve as well. <laughs> so maybe we've got something in common. Um, but, you know, and but that's Jack Villeneuve. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I, and I remember going to my first race for Sky, I think it was Jensen beat, uh, beat Lewis at, um, in, in Melbourne in the first race so um, you know it, it takes a while once Lewis finds his feet you know there's this point where he kind of dabbles a bit at it in the early part of the season and then suddenly he just be, puts his foot down and he's off he's gone and there's no one can stop him and this year he finished on a high didn't he I mean you know yeah. he was competitive right the way through he didn't just take a holiday he thought I can't and maybe the message got through I can't afford to let Valtteri get some ahead of steam or confidence and uh, he just Basically, it's basically, we'll see how he comes out the blocks next year. I mean, he might as well have been on holiday in Abu Dhabi. It was so, that particular race was so easy for the Mercs. Oh, amazing, yeah. Just really got it. So, m- moving on from uh, a team that's got a, a balanced lineup, Ferrari. Um, but they have the most, arguably, the most balanced well, lineup. Well, it, yeah, but, yeah, but, it, but it's, it's too balanced, isn't it, in some ways, because they're trying to keep them apart. I mean, do you, I mean were you. I mean, everyone expected Leclerc to be yep. good in a Ferrari because he was brilliant in a Sauber previously, or Alpha. Um, did he exceed your expectations? Not mine, no. Mm. Um, I, you know, I, I'd watched him in Formula 3. I remember stand, standing watching him um, when, in Portimao when he was doing the Formula 3 race, and then I watched him in Macau and a Po. Uh, you know, circus like that, which, which you separates the super talents mm-hmm. from the less so. Um, you know, he finished on the podium in Macau as a rookie. He was brilliant at Poe through the Fosch chicane. I remember yeah. watching on telly thinking, oh, he's bit, he is quite special. And watch Max the previous year do this thinking similar thing, thing, thinking yeah. this yeah. Is, is something special there. So, um, no, he, he didn't exceed my, my expectations in that respect. What, what surprised me is actually, I think, I think Seb under-delivered, if anything. I think, I think Charles delivered what I expected him to in, you know, challenge Lewis and Mercedes at, at a handful of races across the year, managed to get a couple of wins and, and the rest of it. What perhaps surprised me was the fact that he outperformed Sebastian because you, you would expect Sebastian as a four-time world champion, as the number one, to be the guy there all season. And till Singapore... When they brought the update to the car in Singapore, they, they brought quite a big update. You know, floor, wing, barge walls. It was quite a big update. Um, Seb was never comfortable in it. And since, from Singapore onwards, he was much more evenly matched to, to Leclerc. You know, he got pole in Japan and obviously won in Singapore and all the rest of it. But um, till Singapore, you know, Sebastian has a very particular driving style and, and he needs a car with a very stable rear end on, on corner entry, under braking, medium, slow speed, wants to turn the car and have the rear end with him. And he couldn't do that. He couldn't drive the car the way he liked. And that, it was two tenths a lap. I'm, I'm not making excuses for him, but that's just the way he is. And it was only when they got the updates in Singapore that we started to see the Sebastian of old um, really come into play. But, yeah, unfortunately, um, for him, as I said, I, I think on the whole, he looked back at the season and think... Mm, didn't really deliver what I should have done. 
you know what it's like to win world titles. I mean, if you were in that well, kind of... A title, yeah. singular. <laughs> singular. <laughs> Yeah. Well, <laughs> Plus brands. Yeah, I'm, the, yeah, I'm the champion of brands. I've known what it's like to try to win <laughs> titles, but yeah. Um, I mean, if you were in that kind of position now, and you, do you think you'd have in that position? I know you can't put yourself in that position, but would you be tempted? Do you think to go and, pick, go and get your carpet slippers and go and sit down in Switzerland and have a nice, quiet life? Seb. Yeah. Rather than have to go through all of that. Well, he made. So, he, I mean, yeah. If you're looking at body language and and uh, and so forth, he he did sound very d- kind of. Down in the dumps, didn't he? Um, and but um, he's quite young. I mean, uh, Nico retired when he was very young, but he went out on that high, didn't he? Mm. Got his championship, and off he went. Um, so um, I think I think Sebastian is he wants a, he wants a certain condition in the team. It seems to me, and if he and if he hasn't got that relationship with the team, he was quite comfortable with um, with. Um, uh, Kimmy, the bet there. You know, it seemed like a good relationship. But this guy's come in and he's put him under pressure. And he's not going to, he's not going to back off. And uh, I think that Seb, you know, you know how much you have to dig down to to be at the sharp end of Formula One, and it's very hard if you've got a very very competitive teammate. You have to dig very deep, and it's it, it's the question is whether or not you can do it year in year out at that level. You know, when you think about the intensity of the rivalry between Senna and Prost. You know, these guys were the very best in, the, in uh, their job in the same team. That's why they fought. It's because it was so difficult to put one over on the other. And that environment is not somewhere that I think Ferrari are particularly well-placed to deal with. Um, I, I'm trying to think of a situation where a team... I mean, they had Prost and, and Mansa, which was, which was bad enough, I think. And I'm trying to think of a good relationship they had with, with teammates. It always seems to me very difficult for Ferrari to manage this. They, they prefer the... the, I the, the, the Schumacher would take okay, because then he was happy just to take the check. Well, that's my point. Yeah, is that yeah, actually yeah. Michael still had the upper... Oh, absolutely. He, you know, yeah, yeah. he had the conditions he wanted. And, and I was listening to a, a podcast with Rubens, and you know, it was very much Michael's team from the, from the sounds of it. You know, he, he, um, you know, working in that environment, you, you, and I think Ferrari like, seemed to like... They understand that relationship. They don't know, seem, seem to know what to do when you've got two guys um, fighting for the number one slot. You can't have number one slot in the team. It, you can't share it. It's, you know, one guy's up, one guy's down, and then they start, their heads start spinning. So if you've got a setup that, that Seb needs, what do we do? Do we get that set up? How, which direction do we go in? Do we get that one or the, or the one that um, Charles Leclerc wants? Which direction are we going to go in? And, you know, Seb... Seb's fought back. He, he has fought back, but he's dro- he, you know, he drops the ball. And the thing he did in Brazil, just I just thought was totally ridiculous. You know, he, he just didn't need to do that. Um, the mature thing to have done would have been, you know, to finish slot in behind behind Charles and just let the inevitable happen because the guy was on fresh tyres. Yeah. You know, he wasn't. He weren't going to keep him behind, and and instead he's gone into the winter with um, you know with that over his over his head a little bit. I mean, the team as a whole did seem to make some pretty fundamental mistakes. I'm thinking of Austria when they were focused on the, like, the speeds that uh, Bottas was turning in yeah. and seemed not to notice this very fast blue thing coming up. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. after that bit, which but they, I mean, they just seemed to miss that completely. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that was just, just being asleep, really. Um, you know, Sochi. The whole team orders thing was just a joke, you know. On lap three, you're trying to impose team orders. And actually, it needed Seb in the cockpit to say, what are you talking about? Let us go in the first stint and break away from Mercedes because you want to break the threat from Mercedes and sort it out. It's a one-stop race. Sort it out after the pit stops. And Seb was absolutely right. But then when he had the engine issue, and they, they, it was in the middle of them sorting out, you know, the dry, they'd done this pit stop and they just swapped over and they're trying to work it all out. And instead of thinking... The engine's blown. Let's think about this. The engine's gone. Make him stop somewhere that's not going to induce a safety car. They make him stop at a part of the track where there's literally no yeah, gate. Yeah. And you have to get a safety car. It costs him the win. It's just, you know, some of it's basic. Monaco, they didn't send Leclerc out for a second run. I mean, it doesn't matter how many tyres you don't have in Q2. In a Ferrari, you're going to get to Q3 anyway. What are you talking about? You know, if you're out in Q1 in Monaco, you're finished. And... It's just some fundamental things that you just looked at it and went, what are you doing? Let's move on to a team that does operate like a racing team. It turns in 1.8, 1.9 second tyre stop somehow. Mm. Red Bull. I mean, obviously, Max is volatile, very, very fast. 
Mm. Um, do you see that that's the Red Bull Honda? Part? I mean, obviously, Red Bull and Honda just had a very open and complementary relationship last year and made pretty solid progress. I um, mean, Honda didn't exactly look like winning a race with McLaren, yeah. um, but you know that in the first season with the proper, t- and, uh, you know, another top team uh, shows what they could do. Um, do you see them being the main threat to Mercedes next season? Me, uh, uh, either of you? Yeah. I do. Uh, I, I, I think been... they're going to be a threat. I think they're going to be. I think they're going to be very. <coughs> you close. both have a glass of red wine. You're both. No, I, I, think, I think it's. Um, so. <laughs> Um, I take more than more than yeah, like half a glass of it anyway. <laughs> um, but um, no, I think I think I genuinely think they are going to be uh, much much closer to to Mercedes as a challenger because I think what we we've got is the reg. I know that they're big teams and they can work, they can probably work on two fronts, but even so, it's going to detract. At some point in the season, there's going to be a, a, a tailing off of investment in these current cars, the 2020 cars, but the 2021 cars. So again, there's going to be a development drop off somewhere during the season. It's, and I think that the, the trend with Red Bull is, is, is up. They've been getting better. The car looks better. It's been closer in more races than it's not. And Honda want to keep pushing. They've, they've, they've signed up. They know they're carrying on. So there's no reason for them to back off on that front. Um, and I think that Mercedes are, on the engine front, and the power unit front, I think Mercedes are starting to, to level out. They're reaching a ceiling somewhere and they don't seem to be able to break through. Um, so that gap could close. And I do think to, that they could be, they could be um, maybe not, certainly taking wins off of, off of Mercedes, I think, or being in the, think, in the mix more. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure about when you said your comment on Max. I think we saw a different Max this year, to be honest. Um, you know, we saw a mistake in Mexico where he didn't back off and when Bottas a crash and obviously got a penalty and lost potential win there. But he's been exceptional this year. Oh, absolutely. I no, think, when I, when it's me, a volatile, that sort of meant, you know, his, his character. Out, out, out of, out sure, of but, uh, you know, in the cockpit, <coughs> he's, he's, he's a remarkable, mm. remarkable young guy. You know, he's, a, for how young he is, how... Uh, you know, I, I often have the the team radio channels set up and, and, you know, listen through. And I've got Lewis, Max, Leclerc and, and Vettel. And the tone between the difference between them, you wouldn't imagine that Max is, is he's the calmest out of the lot. He's just, yeah. you know, he knows what he wants. He knows what he wants from the car. He knows what, he, what information he wants from the engineer. He doesn't mess around and use five sentences when he can use one or five words and he use one. Um, and he just has a very methodical way. His mind is is so mature beyond his actual age. It's yeah. remarkable. And um, I, I hope they hit the ground running because that's been the problem in recent years is they haven't arrived in Melbourne with a car that's there. It's taken half a season for them to get, get on top of it. If they rock up in Melbourne with a car competitive enough, he, he will be a championship contender because he's mentally ready for it. So, <clears throat> hypothetical situation. You two go to the pub later, decide you're going to set up a Formula One team next year, Hill Chandog Racing or vice versa. Lead driver, Charles Leclerc or Max Verstappen? Oh. Max. Oh. Max. Yeah, that's, I'd, I'd, probably, I'd probably go with what Karen just said there because um, as, he, as he just described, the guy's so mature. I mean, it's 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 incredible to believe he's only what 21, 20, 21 now? 22. Oh, 22. Yeah. He's, not, he's not very old. I mean, isn't he? I mean, it's a baby. I yeah. mean, but he's not a baby. That's the point. He's actually. You only have to you only talk to him and and see him go about his business. He's he's um, logical. He's matter of fact. He's he doesn't get involved in a lot of uh, you know politics too much, does he? He just. Is is a very very impressive individual, and he was like that the moment he arrived. Even when he was seventeen, it was just seemed incredible that this guy was so mature. Um, so the speed he's got, the maturity he's got, the aggressiveness, um, and yeah, he's he's one or two drops dropouts, but really for for his age, uh, I think he's a little bit ahead of Charles. Charles has made one or two um, errors. He admits to his own mistakes, which is perhaps a little bit um, a little bit too hasty sometimes. Um, but that's a good sign. At least he's not, he's not trying to hide from, from things. 
Um, and I think he's got a, he, he's got a good character too, Charles. You know, he's he, but still got a lot to learn on the. I think about Formula One and, and the, the the racing side of things and the tactic. Yeah. He, yeah. He's still he's more um, emotional. I think as a character, you listen to him on the radio and you see his body language and stuff. There's, there's lots of ups and downs. As Max is is you know is a bit flatter <laughs> in that <laughs> respect. And we saw, you know, mistakes in Paco from Charles. We saw a mistake in Monaco, Melbourne in the race. He was off a few times. Um, you know, there have been instances in the races where the, there's certain stints where you see moments, you know, the odd lock up and the odd run off into the runoff area and stuff. Whereas you see Max in that sort of Schumacher esque way and Alonso esque way just rattling out lap after lap. Um, yeah, I, I think that's. Do you, I mean, do you think that. Uh when, when you hear Max on the radio, and you hear far more of it than I do, mm. uh, I mean, he's very, as you say, he knows what he wants, he's very authoritative. Whereas Charles sometimes, in conversation on the radio, seems a little bit, uh, you know, there's a little bit, he doesn't have the same air of authority, decisiveness yet. Yeah, I think that's what, I think that's what, that's, I'm, that's, 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 that's what I'm saying. It's emotional maturity in yeah. some way. And I think that's where Max is actually the most impressive part. You know, the driving bit, they, they're all exceptional. They're all fantastic talents. But I think the difference between them is, as we've talked about already, is just Max's mat- emotional maturity just takes him to a different level. <clears throat> Looking at the slightly bigger Red Bull picture, mm. I mean, they've got uh, next year they've got Max Verstappen alongside a driver they sacked, then rehired, then promoted to replace a driver who'd been promoted but then got sacked, no, relegated. And the other guy in the Toro Ross has been sacked twice and then reinstated. Um, they, I think the... Yes. The, they've got, I mean, there was a time when they had a talent pool yeah. just south of Formula One, which they'd have six, seven drivers who were potentially just about ready to plug into a Toro Rosso. <gasps> yeah, no, I, I mean, when I was a Red Bull Junior in GP2, it was Bohemi, myself, and Michael Amamuller in GP2, yeah. but they also had Jev, Danny Ricardo, Jaime Algasari in Formula 3. Um, they had Robert Wickens um, and Mikhail Aleshin in F2. Yeah. You know, they're... They had seven, eight of us all there, just sort of on the periphery, really. Um, and I think some of the effect came when they had a point where they thought, hang on, why are we investing all this money in all these junior categories? Because it was millions, mm. you know, GP2 budget, Formula 3 budget and stuff. And when they had, you know, they had <clears throat> Seb, Daniel, Carlos Sainz Jr., um, and they had Kifiat at the time, you know, they, and they were all doing a, a reasonable job. And they had quite a young, and then they had Max. So they had this, this sort of talent pool already in F1 of young drivers. And it's almost like they, they didn't think that Seb would leave and go to Ferrari. They didn't think Daniel would leave and go to Renault. And all of a sudden, um, there are these big holes. And the one that I, I can't understand is why they didn't take Carlos back. Because I, I believe there was a window of, of opportunity where, um, you know, he was at Renault for a year. And before he went to McLaren, there was a small window where, where he could have gone back to the main Red Bull team. Not to Toro Rosso, but they, they would have had to guarantee him a, a seat at the top team. And they didn't take it and they signed Gasly. And to me, that, that, that decision there is, if you look at what Carlos has done mm. this year, to me, he's my third, you know, he's, he's the third best driver if I did a ranking this season. I'd have Carlos at number three. I think he's done an exceptional job this season. Yeah, I mean, one of the big problems we've got is people's careers now in Formula 1 are going for 20 years. Mm. <laughs> well, it's a, good, it's a good thing in some ways because it, yeah. it, it, it measures, uh, it's it a means, measure of safety. It's a measure of safety. safety. I mean, I do remember Bernie coming out with one of his classics um, a few years ago um, and, and because people were talking about why people were in Formula 1 for so long and he said that oh, the problem is that they're not getting killed. killed yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and uh, in his own inimitable way, uh, well, there's such a lot of heart and feeling in there, uh, but um, he, he, you know, he's, he's a very much misunderstood person. I, we understand what he was saying, it's just the way he said it, it was a bit yeah. brutal, but th- that is a fact. Maybe you know, you're an old man. I, well, yeah, no, but this was when he was a bit younger as well, so. But, 79. You know, he was only 70, yeah. yeah. Um, but the point is that, you know, people, there was a few, a, 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 a throughput, shall we put it, in, in motor racing not so long ago, and, and even... A long career would be 15, career, 15 seasons, and now you've got Kimi there who's 
what is he? He must be there for his 19th 2000, season. 2002 was his first. No, 2001, wasn't it? it was 2001, yeah, 2001. Yeah. So we're up I mean, to his 19th. He disappeared off rallying for a little while. Yeah, right? yeah he disappeared for a few, bit, yeah. came back. Um, and, um, but Lewis is the second Lewis's, oldest driver. Yeah. Mm. And so these, yeah. the careers are, careers are going off a long time. How do you get throughput? And I think Red Bull, uh, to, to be honest, we have to thank Red Bull for bringing up lots of talent. And of course, bring, finding Max Verstappen as well. And, 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 Bed, and, and Vettel. And, yeah. to Seb and, and all Rick. those. Danny yeah, and, and some great drivers. Danny Rick, exactly. So Carlos. And so Red Bull are one of the few teams. Going back to a little bit of what we were saying, comparing the, uh, a racing team to Ferrari. I think Red Bull are a racing team. There, um, I often describe Williams as an engineering team that went racing, and and I think Ferrari a little bit like that. But Red Bull are a race team, and they they've done this thing. They've gone out. They found the very best talent. They've got a guy to do that. They've got Helmut Marco, and he's gone out and he's found the most talented guys, and he's given them the most incredible opportunity of a lifetime by saying we can take you all the way to F1. All you have to do is win everything. Yeah. All right. As you know, that's simple, right? So no pressure. But if you don't win, forget it. You're off. And and actually. You know, what racing driver worth their salt wouldn't grab that with both hands and, and give it everything they've got? And it's produced these very, very talented drivers, but they, ha- they can't put them all in the same team. But, but I think to They've your got point, two teams, you know. to, to your original point, have, has Marco dropped the ball with that and have Red Bull dropped the ball in terms of the, the feeding the, the system, I guess, is sort of where you're going with, with the drivers they've ended up with. And you could argue that, yes, they did, because they didn't sign Leclerc when he was coming along. They didn't sign Lando when he was coming along or George Russell or Ocon, you know, other that's teams and other people got there they, first. They've got enough. They, and they can't, but they don't, they can't though. They, and I think that's... They've got I'm loads not, of kids at karting level and Formula Renault level, but, yeah. there's, but there's nothing... But, you know, the did, they, this year had two drivers alongside Max, yeah, who could, neither could, of whose average was less than four tenths away from him. Hmm. That's, I mean, a four tenths hmm. delta to your teammate is, yeah. is massive, really. Yeah. Um, and, and I think Therefore, that, that, that leaves that gap. You know, if they had an Ocon or a Leclerc or a Lando or a George, would that gap have been closer? Don't are know. They, we they, don't know. Are they in any different situation to Mercedes, though? I mean, they're, they're putting a lot of emphasis or putting a lot of eggs in one basket in terms of drivers, aren't they? So Lewis is key to, to Mercedes and also Max is key to It is a bit different. I think it's a little bit different because Valtteri still finished second in the World Championship. His average qualifying gap to Lewis was only point, I think Ant and I looked at it, was point one two or something like that. You know, it's less yeah, they, than a 10 and a half. Breathing space, so they got somebody mm-hmm. there who's, when Lewis falters, okay, mm-hmm. Valtteri had certain days, as you mentioned before, where he was fourth, fifth, and sixth. But for the most part, across the year, if Lewis decided halfway through the year that he was off to be a rap artist, mm. he would have still <laughs> probably won the world championship with Valtteri. Um, and I think Red Bull haven't got that. Mm. And that, that's, that's the difference. And... Yeah, it is. I mean, I think Alex deserves another chance. He, you know, missed half the season, didn't do any of the testing. He's got, he deserves another opportunity to, to close that gap. You know, they replaced Gasly for him. Um, Gasly, in some ways, the perception is, it's funny, isn't it? The perception in this game, because when you look at the average qualifying gap between Gasly and Max and then Albon and Max, Albon's actually further away, he, only by two hundreds, but he's further away. Yet, but his because race performances have been better. The ra- mm. Because in the races, yeah. he's been able to come through. But also, I think some of it is because Gasly went through the first seven races where the Red Bull wasn't as good. Mm. Yes. You know, and, and therefore, he would qualify sometimes surrounded by the midfield. Because the car wasn't as good as it was later in the year, he couldn't get through the midfield pack. So by the time he eventually sometimes got through, the leaders are gone. They're 45 seconds up the road, and then they start. They, he gets lapped. I mean... The race in, in Hungary was probably his lowest point. You know, he was over a minute behind Max, who nearly won the race. And I think they were right to promote Albon at that point. But what Gasly then did in the Toro Rosso shows that he's not a bad racing driver. You know, he did a, a very good job in the Toro Rosso. So it's a perception game as much as anything else, isn't it? From what I've heard, is that I think the Red Bull is actually a trickier car to drive, though, it is, yeah. than the, the Toro Rosso. So um, there's, a, there's a little bit of uh, an art to finding the, the sweet spot with that car. It's a bit like the Ducatis in MotoGP, wasn't it, all those years where Casey Stoner was the only one who seemed to be able to 
win anything and everything on it, he, he and then probably, nobody will take it I'd be able to do yeah. it. I'd be able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd yeah, right. yeah, yeah. just never, I, I, I'm afraid I've moved on to better things by then. No, I, I love bike racing. I mean, it is incredible when you look at what, I know we're here to talk about cars, but Mark Marquez in, in what he's doing on motorbikes is just mind blowing. And, and I think it does raise a question for our sport. You know, we've got these regulation changes coming in and they've done a lot of work on trying to get the racing closer. We'll, we'll see, I, I'm, I'm optimistic for that. But what I think that we're missing is, the, is, is what you can see um, of the driving art from the outside a little bit. You know, I, we, you know we obviously see it in the wet. Um, in qualifying, you get the fantastic close-ups and, the, and the, you can see where the drivers are actually doing stuff. But you, you, you only have to look at a couple of laps of MotoGP and you see them doing the most extraordinary things on these bikes. Um, well, yeah. I, mean, the, I mean, the other thing is, I mean, a, a MotoGP bike around Silverstone is about 28, 30 seconds slower than the Formula One car. Yeah. But which looks more spectacular. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's, 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 but it's the racing, as Damon mentioned. You know, the fact that, they, you know, although Marquez utterly dominated the season and, you know, won it with, with, with time to spare, but he, the, they're able to go wheel to wheel and the elbows out and, you know, he's... Shoulders out. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're never going to get that in car racing. We should, you know, we should also manage our expectations. But what we have now is is ridiculous. You know, I think the you didn't watch Damon in the Formula Ford Festival. No, I didn't. That, that, that I was, was born. Uh, what year was that? <laughs> oh, I can't remember. Where were you born? Eighty four, eighty five. I was but, born in eighty four. Yeah, so. yeah. But you no, know, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, I had nothing to do with that. Um, but um, you know, when you look at talking about the the, the visual, how it appears, um, when you look at. Goodwood, I think a lot of people here will, will understand this. You know, when you look at the cars that are going around Goodwood, like these, these Jaguars or whatever, um, they're sliding around and it looks fantastic to, to see someone controlling a car. The lap time is, is dreadful, you know, but the racing is fantastically close. And I think that we went down this road with Aero. Um, we're stuck with it. If you look at cars, F1 cars now, you turn on the TV and you see the camera angles are very good now. They've got, they, the speed looks amazing. If you go to Silverstone, you look at them going through the Beckett section, it is phenomenal to see how fast they go. But after a while, you get used to it. After a while, you're going to go, that's how fast they go. And uh, they go around Melbourne, um, 10 seconds, lap, the pole position was 10 seconds. That's one of the tracks that hasn't changed on the calendar. Um, <clears throat> and they go around there 10 seconds, lap faster than my pole position, oh, or in 96. So Villeneuve was on pole in 96, wasn't it? All right. <laughs> fair point. Just a point. Yeah. That's a fair point. Anyway, the pole position of 96. You won the race. But I won the race. Anyway, so, but it doesn't matter. Um, we're not here to talk about me. I was talking about well, there's Sam another Villeneuve. thing. There's another, you know. Um, but yeah, that, so my point is, uh, Formula One cars, people seemed satisfied with Formula One cars then. They seemed fast and people turned up to watch it. Um, and, and, and now they tend to go faster. But do we get any more of that? Do we, under, we, do we the, understand what that means? You're absolutely right. I think what happened in 2017, the, the rule change that happened in 2017, was, was wrong. And you know, at the time, I believed it was wrong. And you know, sort of three years into these rule changes, I stand by it. Because someone somewhere got hung up on lap time. Someone got hung up about, you know, in 2016, oh, the cars don't look fast enough. Let's make them faster. Guess what? It makes the racing worse. And, and we all, you know, there's so many people who looked at it at the time and went, this is just wrong. And in some ways, there were too many engineering and engineers leading that decision-making process. And engineers love making fast, you know, I know we're in a building with engineering royalty, <laughs> but... <laughs> but it, it, These electrical engineers. They're electrical, they're yes. electrical engineers. <laughs> As we learned earlier. We've learned this, yeah. So, the mechanical engineers are down the road. Down so the road. We need to, you know, but it's the aero... It, to it, start a fight. It's the aero guys that actually <laughs> made a mess of this one. But, um, yeah, and I think, you know, that's... What we needed was entertainment people saying, hang on, actually what we want is... is racing to be more entertaining but well, we've got we've got liberty who are which is now people. coming they along. are they're entertainment people yeah, yeah. Aren't they? but yeah they weren't there when that rule so happened so the, hopefully so 21 as you talked about before yeah everything that we heard in austin makes us cautiously optimistic um that it's, it's going to be better yeah princess yachts the uk's leading luxury yacht manufacturer proud sponsors of motorsports formula one coverage
when we sat down as a group and, and looked at the brief originally, um, foiling kind of jumped out as, a, as an option. Traditionally, hydrofoils on power boats have just been static and they've, they've, they've helped to increase the efficiency slightly. These not only do that, they're, they're active, so they, they help control the roll and pitch of the boat and make the boat not only more comfortable, but, but safer and easier to drive. We are on the cusp here, I think, of changing the direction of the boat industry. AFS works in conjunction with a reimagined hull concept. Low transfer immersion brings higher efficiencies at cruising speeds. Foil lift replaces transom volume, allowing top speeds to still be achieved. Foils automatically deploy and retract flush with the hull. The foils rake fore and aft, varying the angle of attack. Port and starboard foils are controlled independently. Onboard sensors and a dedicated processor calculate the optimum foil position 100 times per second. Foil position is actively controlled reacting to the boat state, improving comfort, stability and safety with modes selected by the skipper. One of the feel-good stories of the season was McLaren's recovery from sort of more or less the back mm. of the grid up to fighting in the top six on a reasonably regular basis. It was a McLaren, still a Renault engine, mm. but they had two new drivers, Sainz and Norris. What was the, what was the sweet spot? What, what, was, what was the ingredient there that made, made do you think, that, you know, made, made the recovery possible? Aero. They, you know, ultimately, as you said, the power unit rules are... They're homologated. They, they haven't changed vastly. Um, they got. They went down this sort of rabbit hole in 2018. I mean, there were there were times where Alonso was being outqualified by Sergei Sorokin and Lance Stroll mm. and the Williams, and no disrespect to them, but they're not, not Fernando Alonso, Alonso no. and that that convincingly showed that McLaren at times had the slowest car in 2018. So their their turnaround has been has been remarkable. It's yeah. unbelievable, and it shows that turnarounds are possible still in the sport. But it, it's all about aero and, you know, James Key, Andreas Seidel joined the team and they sort of walked into this thing where the car's better. Their effect will only be seen next year. But they're on the up, aren't they? They've got a Mercedes engine contract in the back. They've got a new wind tunnel coming. They've got two brilliant, young, talented drivers. Um, as I said, James Key and Andreas Seidel at the top. Zach now doing what he does best. He doesn't have to manage his team day to day because he's got Andreas doing that. He can go out and sell the sponsorship yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's the sponsor deals coming in. McLaren, McLaren on the whole is massively on the up. But they, they did, that didn't happen by accident. I mean, Zach went in there. Zach is a very pragmatic person. He doesn't want a long, complicated answer. Yeah. He, won't, he won't give you a long, complicated answer. You know, if he says, and he probably will be American. <laughs> so, just, but, you know, that's, that's his way. And I think, and he went into McLaren and I think he got a lot of, answers he wasn't satisfied with and he went this isn't right and he's made some changes so we've got to give him a lot of credit for what has happened at, mm -hmm. uh, at McLaren he's had the the balls to do it and it's not easy when you go into a team with a reputation like um, like that but he wasn't uh, cowed by that he wasn't intimidated by that and he knew what had to be done and he's got Adrian Suttle and James Key and um, Adrian Andreas uh, Seidel sorry and um, and James Key in there and he's made changes and some people who were there are no longer there it has, sometimes it has to happen. Sometimes a shake-up has to happen. And we're, I think we're seeing the, 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 the fruits of his, uh, of his um, bravery you know, to, to actually make changes uh, coming, to, coming to fruition there. We just had the five-minute board for this section of the evening. So right, OK. Um, oh, flying. Couple, couple, just a couple more questions before we turn, turn the microphone to the audience. And um, we've already established that the new... Hill Chandock Formula One team in 2021. We've Ma nicked Max. Yeah, you've got Max. Max. Max is Max. You've got, Max. Max. You've got, you've got, you've got, you've got Max. So, um, Are so you paying his wages? No. <laughs> <laughs> Choices for the second driver Lando Norris, George Russell, Alexander Alban. Does this have to be one of those three? You, well, you're not getting it. <clears throat> um, the, the, well, I just. I, of I, the three rookies this year, I mean, okay. yeah, if you had to choose a rookie, I'm, shall I'm we say? I'm going to jump on Lando. Right, I, uh, and I think that I would no disrespect to George because the thing is we just can't measure what he's done in a way. 
Yeah. But Lando, I the think... The George done... Russell drove rings around Lando in Formula 2, that George Russell. Well, we, we, <laughs> unfortunately, this is about, it's about F1. Can yeah, they do true. it in F1? And, 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 he's, and when you've got all the pressure and stuff, I think Lando did an absolutely fantastic job for, for a newcomer to Formula 1. Teenage newcomer. Yeah, yeah. absolutely amazing. And... Um, sensible you know he's not it doesn't show signs of it going to his head you know he's, he is himself he's relaxed with, with interviews he's you know mixes with the guys i think it's amazing yeah i i would agree actually and they've been teammates already haven't they max and lando they play this esports oh yeah yeah, yeah, team, yeah, yeah, yeah. Teammates already. so when, when they're not doing grand prix <laughs> real grand prix they, they seem to be i, I did this online. um i did this thing with them on the skype out in brazil and they both showed up and we stood there, we ended up standing there chatting for about half an hour. Um, it was just after free practice, I think, on the Friday. And we stood there chatting away. And they were going on and on about this esports race that they, they've got coming up. They, they absolutely love it. They get away from race weekend and they're playing, you know, on this, on this thing. They're doing 24 hour races at Spa and all sorts of things. They, they are absolutely addicted. Um, and, and, you We'd know. We'd have to stop that, though, wouldn't we? You can't have them playing <laughs> computer games in their room all the time, can we? <laughs> you can see, you can see a down. much more experienced dad than me. You want them down for supper, and we want... <laughs> did, did you and Martin yeah, Donnelly not do this in Formula 3? <laughs> Sorry, what? Yeah, so did you and Martin Donnelly not do this in Formula 3? Oh, we didn't have computer games in those days. Why did we play? Oh, God, I don't think they had... We had that thing that you played table tennis on, you know, that spot, you know... Ping pong, whatever it's called. Or a table. <laughs> okay, last, last one for me. You, you mentioned earlier that um, Carlos Sainz would be your third yes. driver. So, one, two, three from both of you. Uh, Lewis, Max, Carlos. This, is this is a, a prediction for the season? or No, no, no. This is your, 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 your top three that you've just been watching. Of the, to, of the top three of the season, I've just... Yeah. I, 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 would say, um, I would say Lewis. Um, I, would say, uh, I would say Max and then Charles. OK. Right, ladies and gents, there should be a microphone somewhere. In that corner. Microphone. There it is. OK. Um, is there any chance we could just have a little bit more light so I can actually see where the hands are up? Is that... Uh, it always helps. There, okay, there you are. Thank you. Oh, hello. Gosh, right, um, I thought we were alone. You, uh, <laughs> raise your hands if you have a, a question for either, either anybody. Start down there. Hi there. Um, I'm a f I'm a fan of all motorsport, but out of the two, Mark Marquez or Lewis Hamilton, which one's the more dominant in their sport? Mark mm. Marquez, I think. I mean, he's 26 years old. and He's won nine world championships. <laughs> the guy is, it makes you know, it makes everyone just feel like you're a massive underachiever in life, don't you? It's depressing. <laughs> okay, gentleman, a Hawaiian shirt, just there. Hi, do you think um, Max Verstappen shot himself in the foot a bit, being uh, critical of Ferrari then with a potential drive for the future with Ferrari, with, with the accusation of cheating? I, I think, in my experience in our sport, that people have... You know, when, when somebody as talented as Max is available and Ferrari wants him, they'll forget all of that. And, uh, yeah, it will be suddenly all sweetness and light. Yeah. OK, um, let's go over on the left here. We know we can't um, compare eras, but uh, it is. It is. No, we can't compare eras. But uh, Schumacher and Hamilton are probably close enough together to compare. Yeah. Who's the best? Okay. Can you go? No, no. Okay. Well, <laughs> you, ra you, ra you raced against him. Go on. <laughs> Obviously, I think. You crashed into Michael. You should know. You know about him. Mm -hmm. I, I did crash into, and he crashed into me. True. Yes, so, he did. So, yeah. um, I think when you look at Lewis's crashing record, it's quite low, isn't it? I mean, he's, you know, <laughs> so, so on that basis, you'd have to say yeah, that Lewis is a better right. driver. <laughs> never never crashed into. <laughs> okay, gentlemen, just there, the light-coloured jacket coming behind you. I think that it hasn't been mentioned um, in any way, shape or form, this uh, discussion at the moment, but surely Vettel has massively underperformed this year. And everybody's puzzled why well, he hasn't been dropped yet. Because, yeah. and then, of course, the, the idea is who would replace him? And would it be Verstappen's, in Verstappen's interest to join Ferrari? 
I think the 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 slight problem Ferrari still have got is Leclerc's not yet experienced enough to be the team's number one. And I think in some respect they do still need Seb there from a from a technical perspective to lead that team's direction. And and if you look at the way the car got better through the year, a lot of that came because of, of Sebastian. Um, you know, Charles benefited from it. But we saw a lot of mistakes still from Charles. We saw in qualifying, you know, errors on the first run, which meant he had to have another go and use another set, you know, all those sort of things, which will come good. You know, he's got talent and you'd like to think that he lined that up with maturity and experience. I don't think they could afford to still get rid of Seb and, and put the, the, you know, Charles in as a number one, unless Max or Lewis came available. <coughs> I think, you know, it's all well and good to say oh, Seb's made all of these mistakes in the races, which he has, of course, and as you say, he's underperformed. But who do you replace him with? Um, and when you look at the market, you can say possibly Sainz, as, you know, if you got Lewis, Max, you could argue a case for Sainz, but then he'd be a new person, and Sainz and Leclerc is quite an inexper- inexperienced lineup to lead a high-pressure team like Ferrari. Um, you know, I think next year when Sebastian's contract runs up um, and Lewis, you know, is sniffing around elsewhere, Ferrari's certainly interested in him for 21. I think end of next year is going to be fun because you've got 21 new car regs, new technical regs, whole reset in F1. But the driver market is completely up in the air as well. So I think, I think there's a... Next year is a little bit of a transitional year in some yeah. way. I think your point, your point is that Seb has, has had, for someone who's won four world championships, he's had some pretty serious dropouts. Um, he's obviously very capable and still a bit, but I, I think uh, the, the encouraging quote I saw from him uh, after Abu Dhabi was that he knows he has to go and improve. And, and I think that's the first time I've heard him say something like that. I think normally he's, he's tended to bat away any criticism and regard himself as always in the right when, when he's done some very odd things uh, where clearly he, he had some part to, to, to account for it. Um, but I think that's, that's what has to happen with Seb. He has to sit down. He has to go, OK, listen, something's not right. If I've been leading a race and I've dropped the ball, that should not happen. If I am a four-time world champion, can I accept that this is, uh, this is part of my, my package? And why, why do I suddenly lose my temper in a car? Um, because that's what happened. He cracked in Canada. You know, he's, it's not the first time that's happened. And, um, and he, he has to look at why, the, why he has those, those mental weak spots, because they, they are real and they're damaging to his career and his potential. Um, so if you can fix that, then he could, he could have a long and very um, prosperous career from here on, onwards. He's still quite young. So neither of you would put Kimmy back in, would not he? Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. The, um, okay, uh, well, we'll start down here on the, and then next, OK? OK, we, uh, we mentioned uh, McLaren coming good. What do you think about Hondas compared with a few years ago? And then a follow-up to that, what do you think may have happened to, to Honda and McLaren able to keep their relationship going this year? They've got really good electrical engineers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a chat before. I'll definitely sandwich later on. Thank you, yeah. So the question is, as I understand it, is, is that Honda, um, what do we think of Honda's potential? Well, Can, just or, really good. Yeah, they mm-hmm. have. I think they have. I think that I think they they didn't like the environment, um, uh, and in in Japan, it's not the done thing to to be openly critical uh, and humiliating companies with a reputation like Honda. Um, so that put them under a uh, very difficult pressure when they were with McLaren. I think it was a battle of two reputations in a way. McLaren didn't want to be saddled with the the um, the accusation that their car wasn't up to it, and Honda uh, didn't feel comfortable with this pressure. And Unbelievably, actually, in some ways, Red Bull have allowed them the space and not put the pressure on them and said, OK, listen, you do what you do and we will work around that. And, it's, and that combination has worked and delivered the results. And I think if you just let Honda get on with it, they will produce They're a fantastic company. They're a racing company. They started out with racing and they believe in themselves and they believe in their method and they'll, they'll get there. They have committed 500 million to the program or something. So <laughs> yeah, the like 500 million. Yeah, but they don't. They don't have 500 million if they were a rubbish company. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So that's that's yeah. Now I think um, they have made the progress. I'm not sure they're 
fully there yet. Um, yes, Red Bull didn't have any Honda-related reliability issues on the Sundays in the races, but we've got to keep in mind that it's really is four is a four-car team split into the A and the B team, and the Torosos went through seven power units each and took a lot of penalties. So there's an element of them doing a bit of experimenting in R&D for the for the big team. So. You have to factor that into the to the picture, but you're absolutely right. They made really good progress, and you know, long I, may it continue. Just want to say, when in the turbo era, I can remember you could tell when Honda were, were pick, bringing a big push in because the engines would blow up. It was fantastic. They'd be, you know, you, they just put another engine in and they'd go out and this great big ball of fire would come out the back of the car, and, <laughs> and you just knew they were pushing. You know, they were pushing everything. It was good. So oh, thanks, Colin. Can you give me some idea of what happened with Paddy Lowe at Williams this year? I mean, the fact they're three and a half seconds adrift or whatever it is, and all of a sudden Paddy Lowe was fired two days before the start of the season, apparently not knowing which way was up. Now, inside, inside man at Williams, Karoon is going to answer that question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, I don't know, really. <laughs> yes, I mean, are, you, are you asking where he is now? Or where? No, what, what it, it's fundamentally an aero issue, really. Um, you know, Paddy's not an aerodynamicist. Um, and I think, ultimately, the team on the whole have, have lost their way. It, you know, we are very much in an aero era of Formula One. And the 2017 car was not bad. You know, I, I drove it and... You know, it, it and I remember driving at the time, thinking actually, you know, it's it's a balanced car, and it was a car that could get into Q3. You know, Massa could rack up points. Stroll got a podium in Baku. You know, it was a decent car. And then whatever happened in the design of the 18, and then subsequently the 19 car, they just lost their way um, technically. And I think they've lost a lot of people, good people there in the last two years. Really, you've lost Dirk to be a Paddy Lowe, as you mentioned, Rob Smedley's gone. Um, and they haven't really replaced, replaced them. Uh, and I think for, 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 the, for the long-term success of that team, they kind of need to do what McLaren have done in many ways and just go, right, hang on, whatever we were doing is not working. We need a change, Re of, cha change of mentality, a reset, change of design philosophy, change of concept. Uh, and, and then they can make progress because they've still got the Mercedes power unit. You know, that's a massive plus point. So clearly that's not the issue in the competitiveness. It's an aero issue and they need to, they need to get that sorted. Whether that's, it's not one person though. It's a complete department needs a, a reset and a, a change in the thought process and philosophy. Uh, Lord Young Friends, uh, motorsport, I think my name is uh, Claire Williams has been interviewed with another guy, Mike, somebody there. Michael Driscoll, CEO. And they were talking about what was going on, and they said, well, that was all down to these people. And nobody seemed to know who was actually leading the design or anything else like that. It was, oh, it has to work. Whose problem's that? Mm. It was actually. Yeah. I think that, I'll let you Karen, that. Karen, <laughs> just, Karen just uh, alluded to it. I think that they are, they're a little bit lost, and I think that uh, Claire needs to, to find someone that can, can organize the technical team. And, 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 yeah. But getting someone to go to Williams, because it's an enormous job, and have they got the money, that's, that's now another problem. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen, down the right. Yeah, not a, not a technical question. What, what's Kimmy really like? <laughs> I, I've, I've met Kimmy very briefly for dinner. He didn't say much. <laughs> um, once uh, he, yes. whiz, he whizzes around, he goes in and out the paddock. He hardly says anything to anyone, does he? I, 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 I've had one conversation with him in 20 years. Was it a conversation, though? Well, he came up. It was bizarre, really, because we were in a, in a bar in Tokyo after the race. And... It was at some ridiculous time in the morning, and he'd obviously had a lot of clear liquid. Orange juice. <laughs> Orange juice. Yeah. Um, but he just came up to me and went, I want a curry. Take me somewhere. <laughs> 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 and, I, and I just stood there and went, I haven't spoken to you in a decade, yeah, but uh, sure, we could go to dinner. That'll be fun. And then when I said I didn't know where a curry restaurant was in Tokyo, he got me in a headlock. 
wrestled me to the ground, <laughs> and then just walked off. <laughs> so, I've had one conversation with the man. Oh, no, he's, he's priceless, isn't he? I mean, I, mean, it, yeah. I had to do a piece with Renault when he was there, and I was begging them to let me interview Grosjean. And they said, no, no, you're going to talk to Kimmy. I want Gro But there was just two of us talking to him, and he chatted for half an hour, and I'd never known him like and he was just... Completely. But he did this you know, podcast with know. Tom Clarkson on the uh, on the mm. F1 podcast, and it, that's it. Um, it's, it's actually he's actually quite chatty, mm. remarkably. Yeah, that, I mean, I, and I, apparently I his, book quite, his book is quite his book is quite quite good as well. Is it? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Somebody yeah. else said to me there's some good stories in there. That's not the po the one with the haiku poems in, is it? No, that's no, brilliant. No, no, that no, is no. funny. <laughs> um, but um, I actually just remembered I did interview him for Sky about that must have been about five or six years ago now, but. Um, he was, yeah, he's, he's a lovely guy. He seems a nice guy, doesn't he? He seems, you know, he's... I, know, I had one conversation with him. Yeah, he's, uh, <laughs> he put me in a headlock. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> it's nice, like I said, he's a nice guy. <laughs> yeah, so, so go, let's go to the back. There's a hand just up there near you, Connor. Uh, thanks for that, Simon. Um, read in the papers today that Mr Stroll Sr. wants to take a, uh, a stake in Aston Martin. Uh, Lance Stroll for Red Bull in 21? Yeah. No. What, no. But, I, but yeah. is, was I read the story on Reuters? Actually, was it not that they would be sponsoring Racing Point? Is at least the story that I read in that that bit. That I, I think the story I read was he would he was, uh, and again it's all obviously speculative at the time. But it sounds like he was looking to buy the road car company and have them support his Formula One team. So if anything, it involved. Aston Martin switching from Red Bull to Racing Point. That's the way I I I only read the, the story on the um, on the sort of Reuters website. It'd be great, though, wouldn't it? Wake up. The, wait, the, I mean, the just, auto car story said that he was going to. I mean, he, he was looking to buy a stake in the, the road uh, car the, company. The road car company. Yes. The share price for the first time ever then went up. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and then, he and should then, have kept his mouth shut. <laughs> And then, and then, then rebrand Racing Point as Aston Martin, which then what happens with uh, who knows? But yeah, Aston Martin, is it, I mean, it's, 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 Aston Martin is a sports car brand, isn't it? They did do a Formula should, One car in 1959. I, I knew you'd <laughs> know that. I mean, you know, not, did they really? Yes. Uh, how'd DBR, it go? DBR4. Was it good? DBR, OK. Was mm. it good? No. No. Because no. <laughs> well, it was front engine at the time, okay. all the engines were going in the back, so yeah. it was okay. wrong. But it must be great to wake up one morning and go, oh, do you know, I think I'll go and I'll buy, buy, Aston I'll buy Aston Martin. I'm a bit bored, <laughs> you know, go and get Aston. We just think about buying a car and he goes and buys the company. Yeah. <laughs> and in my case, spending about two grand on a car, that's, that's it. OK, there's a yeah, cream coloured shirt just near you, Laura, there. Thanks. That's it. Um, Nico Hulkenberg, is that a career well spent or could he have spent that better at a potentially bigger team? I think I think I mean we saw we saw some flashes of, of his ability, um, and I've always thought he was just such a laid back guy. There wasn't enough there wasn't enough fire there. There wasn't enough anxiety, and um, he seemed to miss you know, the boat every time there was low hanging fruit. You know, there was, you always saw when there was an opportunity of a, you know of this sort of odd podium where a non top three team could get it, it would be Perez or. Science, or you know, got in Brazil, or there'd always be somebody stroll in Baku, or there'd be somebody else but Nico Hulkenberg. Because on that day, you know, in Brazil 2012, he crashed into Lewis, in Baku, when Perez got the podium, he hit the, he hit the inside wall or something. You know, it's, it was always that race where there was something weird would happen, but he'd be the one in that mess rather than the one getting the podium. He, he was unfortunate because at the time when the, all the drivers were forced to lose a lot of weight, his hulk, literally his mm. bulk, uh, was, was a technical massive disadvantage. So yeah. I know for a fact he didn't get drives that some top teams looked at him and just thought we can't put him in because it's going to be too much of a deficit um, just simply because of his size, which is a real shame. Um, but they, in, they since then increased the, the, the allowance for the driver. But but um, uh, I, I, I do think that, you know, maybe he's just too nice a guy. And I think you need to have a nasty streak. Just look at me, for example. Not, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, I was, I was you do. Be, I was about to be nice to you. But I think yeah. I missed it. I, 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 I think he should have ended up at Haas, though. I think it would have been good for Haas because he's experienced. He is, he is still very quick. To replace? He, to replace Grosjean. But then, then, you know, then I think the, Grosjean's wife's not around, and yeah, that, that'll upset Damon. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. We're not going there again. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. You started last time. I did. Yeah. But I she's very nice. <laughs> the thing, the thing that mystifies me about Hulkenberg, though, is that 
Um, and I accept the weight thing completely, but he was, he was a champion in Formula BMW when his weight kind of helped. He was a champion in A1GP, no, weight no difference. Champion in Formula 3, a rookie champion in GP2. I mean, everything about his career. Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 it's special talent. I don't... And I, I, it never yeah, I think he probably could have done with a better manager. Yes. Actually, to be honest, I think he needed someone yes. to say, you know, this guy's, look at his, like you, could have been his manager. If you'd gone in, and you yeah, it's a bit late. It's all too late. It's a shame, isn't it? Mm. But he needed someone, there were certain times, it's Frenson was like that. Yes, yeah. Frenson was unbelievably quick. I mean, he went up and down a little bit, but he was just la he was the he way he a good manager, he nicked your drive. <laughs> I know, he just, no, but I, I said to him once, I said, why are you going for, I remember talking to him, and it was like there was a McLaren drive up for offer, and he was winning everything in the Jordan. And um, I said, are you going to go for this drive? And he said, oh, do you think I should? And I went, <laughs> are you bloody mad? You know, <laughs> you know they, it, some drivers just don't, they, they haven't worked out that you need a strategy to get through Formula One and, st and stay in Formula One. OK, it's um, gentlemen down here. Thanks. Just wondering what you thought about uh, the reintroduction of refueling, maybe. Maybe what do you think about the introduction of refueling? Should we do a... Well, we won't bother with the hands up then. <laughs> right, okay. Why, why not? Because if you talk to a lot of people, they, they think it'd be really exciting. Why would you do it? But, why would you well, do I it? know why we wouldn't do it, but I mean, a lot of people seem to like the drama of the pit stop or something. What, you know, the I think fire that came yeah, the three fire. times. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there were three big fires in yeah. 15 years ago. No, I, it, I don't get it. Is that, uh, think, that, that stat, you know, the fastest lap stat against, so you, you got Lewis and, and, um, and, uh, and uh, Michael, and Michael's got all these fastest laps, and as, as I explained to someone, that's because in those days yeah. we had refueling and everything was run flat out. So, you know, you got a lot of flat out. Yeah, but the race yeah, is dull. Well, I agree. Oh, you don't have to tell me. I know, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> I was there. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> I was just, just making oh, sure. We had to go flat out all the time. <laughs> and we went exactly the same speed as we did in qualifying. The car was like, <laughs> and you didn't catch them up because they were going flat out. No, no. The yeah. top left hand corner there, Connor, thanks. Hello. Uh, my question is uh, with you both having experienced cars from various eras, um, how much of a leap? Do you expect the 2021 cars to be not necessarily with regards to lap time? Well, I think the lap time difference they're talking about is negligible, frankly. You know, what they're talking about today is three seconds, which they'll catch up. In a year of development in the wind tunnel, the teams will catch that, no problem. Um, whether, even if it's slightly behind, I don't think it really matters. What, what we want is them to be able to race. Um, we'll, we'll, and, Drivers will adapt, you know, eras change, technology comes and goes, traction control and active suspension and all this came and went and, you know, the best drivers are still winning and the best cars, are, the best teams are still there or thereabouts. You'll have some sort of a shake up, you know, when active got banned, Bennett and Sudley in 94 came to the front, um, you know, but Williams was still there or thereabouts and McLaren and Ferrari was still the next next two down. So I think ultimately eras change technology. That's always the nature of F1. What we really, I think 21 is really important for the future of F1 because if you look at what's happening in the road car world, you know, the sport is at a, at a crossroads. Um, you know, they, they've got to get this next set of regulations right. Otherwise F1 in the, the long term, it, it yeah. you know, it is really important. Because with, with the, um, also with the, the, the environmental uh, so uh, you know the the rise of it, it concern over uh, the global warming and, and the environment. I mean, Formula One has, has already put in place measures or announced it's going to go carbon neutral. But I mean, people will be looking at the sport and going, uh, "Why are we doing this? You know, we, are we are we promoting um, you know profligacy with with carbon, with uh, fuels? They're looking to to use um, uh, more renewable fuels as well. So that could be a technical avenue that we could go down. But of course. Um, you know, the Formula E will, will, will contest the, their credentials against Formula One, so there's going to be a bit of debate that. So Despite the, all, the fact that they use generators to charge the cars. Yeah. Go around the world. So, <laughs> but, you know, in people's minds, Funny you know, we, we do, we, we've, got, we've got to work out whether or not we're there just for purely for entertainment or whether, whether we're there to prove a point or, or show off our technical 
um, abilities in, in, in solving the world's problems as well. Well, I think ultimately F1 needs, that's what I was saying, F1's at a crossroads um, where my personal belief is it needs to perhaps accept the road relevance is, is less significant. Maybe Formula E with the, the powertrain development, every manufacturer believes you know, electric is the immediate next future step we're all heading towards. So they use Formula E to be that development tool, that's fine. But then Formula One remains the pinnacle of our sport in terms of being the fastest, loudest, sexiest cars on the best tracks with the best drivers and our entertainment. Because there is, it's sporting entertainment in the way that football or cricket or basketball, you know, none of these other things have anything to do with relevance in your life. There's sporting entertainment for you to watch and be entertained by. Um, and I think where, where, this, where my, my train of thought slightly falls apart is obviously the capital required for motorsport is different to football or, or basketball. But ultimately, I think, uh, I think F1 is at that, it, it's on the precipice here of being, what does it want to be? It's, you know, it needs to work out its identity, really. Ladies and gents, I've had the checkered flag sign, I'm afraid, from the back of the auditorium. So um, the, there is one, one more job we have to do. Thank you both, first off, for a very entertaining and keeping me entertained anyway. But be, before we go, um, raffle prize. You take one. Okay. Can I just say thank you very much to the audience as well? Yes. And to you, Simon. Thank, thank you. you. For <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And to Carol. <laughs> This is first prize. First prize, and what do they win? They win a bag of goodies, including a very nice print of Nicky Lauder in 1982. All right, so if, you're, if you've got a white ticket and it's number 99, well done. Congratulations. We have one, yep, okay. And uh, second, second prize, Corinne. Uh, number 53. White 53. There we go. There we go. <laughs> got it. Wasn't the same person. <laughs> I'll, I'll do the last one, which is uh, White 77, which I think is Valtteri Bottas, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and any winners? Yep. Yeah. But if, um, if, uh, if the three of you could present yourselves with your tickets to Laura at the registration desk, she will sort you out with your goodies. Um, Damon's already touched upon it, but I mean, thank you all of you for coming tonight. I hope they've entertained you. Um, thanks to Classic and Sports Finance for the support. Thanks to Steve for the Nicky Lauder print. Thank you to all of you, and thank you particularly to you too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Princess Yachts, the UK's leading luxury yacht manufacturer, proud sponsors of Motorsports Formula One coverage.